It was not long before whispered tales began to pass among the Sindar concerning the deeds of the Noldor, ere they came to Beleriand. Certain it is whence they came, and the evil truth was enhanced and poisoned by lies. But the Sindar were yet unwary and trustful of words, and, as may well be thought, Morgoth chose them for this first assault of his malice, for they knew him not. And Círdan, hearing these dark tales, was troubled, for he was wise and perceived swiftly that, true or false, they were put about at this time through malice, though the malice he deemed was that of the princes of the Noldor, the cause of the jealousy of their houses. Therefore he sent messengers to Thingol to tell all that he had heard. It chanced that at the time the sons of Finarfin were again the guests of Thingol, for they wished to see their sister Galadriel. Then Thingol, being greatly moved, spoke in anger to Finrod, saying, Ill have you done to me, kinsman, to conceal so great matters from me, for now I have learned of all the evil deeds of the Noldor. But Finrod answered, What ill have I done you, lord? Or what evil deed have the Noldor done in all your realm to grieve you? Neither against your kingship nor against any of your people have they thought evil or done evil. I marvel at you, son of Eowyn, said Thingol, that you would come to the board of your kinsmen thus red-handed from the slaying of your mother's kin, and yet say naught in defence nor yet seek any pardon. Then Finrod was greatly troubled, but he was silent, for he could not defend himself save by bringing charges against the other princes of the Noldor, and that he was loath to do before Thingol. But in Angrod's heart the memory of the words of Caranthia welled up again in bitterness, and he cried, Lord, I know not what lies you have heard, nor whence, but we came not red-handed. Guiltless we came forth, save maybe of folly, to listen to the words of fell Feanor, and become as if besotted with wine, and as briefly, no evil did we do on our road, but suffered ourselves great wrong, and forgave it. For this we are named tale-bearers to you, and treasonable to the Noldor, untruly, as you know, for we have of our loyalty been silent before you, and thus earned your anger, that now these charges are no longer to be borne, and the truth you shall know. Then Angrod spoke bitterly against the sons of Feanor, telling of the blood at Alqualonde, and the doom of Mandos, and the burning of the ships at Loscar, and he cried, Wherefore should we that endured the grinding ice bear the name of kinslayers and traitors? Yet the shadow of Mandos lies on you also, said Melian. But Thingol was long silent ere he spoke. Go now, he said, for my heart is hot within me. Later you may return, if you will, for I will not shut my doors for ever against you, my kindred, that were ensnared in an evil that you did not aid. With Fingolfin and his people also I will keep friendship, for they have bitterly atoned for such ill as they did, and in our hatred of the power that wrought all this woe, our griefs shall be lost. But hear my words. Never again in my ears shall be heard the tongue of those who slew my kin in Alquilonde, nor in all my realm shall it be openly spoken while my power endures, and all the Sindor shall hear my command that they shall neither speak with the tongue of the Noldor nor answer to it. And all such as use it shall be held slayers of kin, and betrayers of kin unrepentant. Then the sons of Finarfin departed from Menegroth with heavy hearts, perceiving how the words of Mandos would ever be made true, and that none of the Noldor that followed after Feanor could escape from the shadow that lay upon his house, and it came to pass even as Thingol had spoken. For the Sindar heard his word, and thereafter throughout Beleriand, they refused the tongue of the Noldor, and shunned those that spoke it aloud. But the exiles took the Sindar in tongue in all their daily uses, and the high speech of the West was spoken only by the lords of the Noldor among themselves. Yet that speech lived ever as a language of law wherever any of that people dwelt. 
It came to pass that Nargothrond was full wrought, and yet Turgon still dwelt in the halls of Vinyama, and the sons of Finarfin were gathered there to a feast, and Galadriel came from Doriath and dwelt a while in Nargothrond. Now King Finrod Felagund had no wife, and Galadriel asked him why this should be. But foresight came upon Felagund as she spoke, and he said, An oath I too shall swear, and must be free to fulfil it, and go into darkness. Nor shall anything of my realm endure that a son should inherit. But it is said that not until that hour had such cold thoughts ruled him. For indeed, she whom he had loved was Amaria of the Vanya, and she went not with him into exile. Of Maeglin Arathel Arfeniel, the white lady of the Noldor, daughter of Fingolfin, dwelt in Nevrast with Torgon, her brother, and she went with him to the hidden kingdom. But she wearied of the guarded city of Gondolin, desiring ever the longer, the more to ride again in the wide lands, and to walk in the forests, as had been her wont in Valinor. And when two hundred years had passed since Gondolin was full wrought, she spoke to Torgon, and asked leave to depart. Torgon was loath to grant this, and long denied her. But at the last he yielded, saying, Go then, if you will, though it is against my wisdom, and I forebode that ill will come of it both to you and to me. But you shall go only to seek Fingon, our brother, and those that I send with you shall return hither to Gondolin as swiftly as they may. But Arathel said, I am your sister, and not your servant, and beyond your bounds I will go as seems good to me, and if you begrudge me an escort, then I will go alone. Then Turgon answered, I grudge you nothing that I have. Yet I desire that none shall dwell beyond my walls who know the way hither. And if I trust you, my sister, others I trust less to keep guard on their tongues. And Turgon appointed three lords of his household to ride with Arathel, and he bid them lead her to Fingon in Hithlam, if they might prevail upon her. And be wary, he said. For though Morgoth be yet hemmed in the north, there are many perils in Middle-earth of which the lady knows nothing. Then Arathel departed from Gondolin, and Turgon's heart was heavy at her going. But when she came to the ford of Brithiach in the river Syrian, she said to her companions, Turn now south and not north, for I will not ride to Hithlam. My heart desires rather to find the sons of Feanor, my friends of old. And since she could not be dissuaded, they turned south as she commanded, and sought admittance into Doriath. But the march wardens denied them, for Thingol would suffer none of the Noldor to pass the girdle, save his kinsfolk of the house of Finarfin, and least of all those that were friends of the sons of Feanor. Therefore the march wardens said to Arathel, To the land of Kelegorm for which you seek, lady, you may by no means pass through the realm of King Thingol. You must ride beyond the girdle of Melian to the south or to the north. The speediest way is by the paths that lead east from the Brithiach, through Dimba, and along the north march of this kingdom, until you pass the bridge of Esgalduin, and the fords of Aros, and come to the lands that lie behind the hill of Himring. There dwell, as we believe, Kelegorm and Kurufin and it may be that you will find them, but the road is perilous. Then Arathel turned back and sought the dangerous road between the haunted valleys of Ered Gorgoroth and the north fences of Doriath. And as they drew near to the evil region of Nan Dun Gortheb, the riders became enmeshed in shadows, and Arathel strayed from her companions and was lost. They sought long for her in vain, fearing that she had been ensnared or had drunk from the poisoned streams of that land. But the fell creatures of Ungoliant that dwelt in the ravines were aroused and pursued them, and they hardly escaped with their lives. When at last they returned and their tale was told, there was great sorrow in Gondolin, and Turgon sat long alone, enduring grief and anger in silence. 
But Arathel, having sought in vain for her companions, rode on, for she was fearless and hardy of heart, as were all the children of Finwe. And she held on her way, and crossing Esgalduin and Aros, came to the land of Himlad between Aros and Kelon, where Kelagorm and Corufin dwelt in those days, before the breaking of the siege of Angband. At that time they were from home, riding with Caranthia east in Thargelion. But the people of Kelagorn welcomed her, and bade her stay among them with honour until their lord's return. There for a while she was content, and had great joy in wandering free in the woodlands. But as the year lengthened and Kelagorm did not return, she became restless again, and took to riding alone ever further abroad, seeking for new paths and untrodden glades. Thus it chanced in the waning of the year that Arathel came to the south of Himlad, and passed over Kelon, and before she was aware, she was enmeshed in Nan Elmoth. In that wood, in ages past, Melian walked in the twilight of Middle-earth, when the trees were young, and enchantment lay upon it still. But now the trees of Nan Elmoth were the tallest and darkest in all Beleriand, and there the sun never came. And there Eol dwelt, who was named the Dark Elf. Of old he was the kin of Thingol, but he was restless and ill at ease in Doriath, and when the girdle of Melian was set about the forest of Region, where he dwelt, he fled thence to Nan Elmoth. There he lived in deep shadow, loving the night and the twilight under the stars. He shunned the Noldor, holding them to blame for the return of Morgoth to trouble the quiet of Beleriand. But for the dwarves he had more liking than any other of the elven folk of old. From him the dwarves learned much of what passed in the lands of the Eldar. Now the traffic of the dwarves down from the Blue Mountains followed two roads across East Beleriand, and the northern way, going towards the fords of Aros, passed nigh to Nan Elmoth. And there Eol would meet the Naugrim and hold converse with them. And as their friendship grew, he would at times go and dwell as guest in the deep mansions of Nogrod, or Belagost. There he learned much of metalwork, and came to great skill therein, and he devised a metal as hard as the steel of the dwarves, but so malleable that he could make it thin and supple, and yet it remained resistant to all blades and darts. He named it Galvorn, for it was black and shining like jet, and he was clad in it whenever he went abroad. But Eol, though stooped by his smithwork, was no dwarf, but a tall elf of a high kin of the Teleri, noble though grim of face, and his eyes could see deep into shadows and dark places. And it came to pass that he saw Arathel Arfaniel, as she strayed among the tall trees near the borders of Nan Elmoth, a gleam of white in the dim land. Very fair she seemed to him, and he desired her. And he set his enchantments about her, so that she could not find the ways out, but drew ever nearer to his dwelling in the depths of the wood. There were his smithy and his dim halls, and such servants as he had, silent and secret as their master. And when Arathel, weary with wandering, came at last to his doors, he revealed himself, and he welcomed her, and led her into his house. And there she remained, for Aeol took her to wife, and it was long ere any of her kin heard of her again. It is not said that Arathel was wholly unwilling, nor that her life in Nan Elmoth was hateful to her for many years. For though at Eol's command she must shun the sunlight, they wandered far together under the stars, or by the light of the sickle moon, or she might fare alone as she would, save that Eol forbade her to seek the sons of Feanor or any others of the Noldor. And Arathel bore to Eol a son in the shadows of Nan Elmoth, and in her heart she gave him a name in the forbidden tongue of the Noldor, Lomian that signifies child of the twilight. But his father gave him no name until he was twelve years old. Then he called him Maeglin, which is sharp glance, 
for he perceived that the eyes of his son were more piercing than his own, and his thought could read the secrets of hearts beyond the mist of words. As Maeglin grew to full stature, he resembled in face and form rather his kindred of the Noldor, but in mood and mind he was the son of his father. His words were few, save in matters that touched him near, and then his voice had a power to move those that heard him, and to overthrow those that withstood him. He was tall and black-haired, his eyes were dark yet bright and keen as the eyes of the Noldor, and his skin was white. Often he went with Eol to the cities of the dwarves in the east of Eredlindon, and there he learned eagerly what they would teach, and above all, the craft of finding the ores of metals in the mountains. Yet it is said that Maeglin loved his mother better, and if Eol were abroad, he would sit long beside her and listen to all that she could tell him of her kin and their deeds in Eldamar, and of the might and valour of the princes of the house of Fingolfin. All these things he laid to heart, but most of all that which he heard of Turgon, and that he had no heir. For Elenwe, his wife, perished in the crossing of the Hel Caraxa, and his daughter, Idril Celebrindel, was his only child. In the telling of these tales there was awakened in Arathel a desire to see her own kin again, and she marvelled that she had grown weary of the light of Gondolin and the fountains in the sun and the green sward of Tumladen under the windy skies of spring. Moreover, she was often alone in the shadows when both her son and her husband were away. Of these tales also grew the first quarrels of Maeglin and Eol, for by no means would his mother reveal to Maeglin where Turgon dwelt, nor by what means one might come thither, and he bided his time, trusting yet to wheedle the secret from her, or perhaps to read her unguarded mind. But ere that could be done, he desired to look on the Noldor, and speak with the sons of Feanor, his kin, that dwelt not far away. But when he declared his purpose to Eol, his father was wrathful. "'You are of the house of Eol, Maeglin, my son,' he said, "'and not of the Golothrim. "'All this land is the land of the Teleri, "'and I will not deal nor have my son deal "'with the slayers of our kin, "'the invaders and usurpers of our homes. "'In this you shall obey me, "'or I will set you in bonds.' "'And Maeglin did not answer, but was cold and silent, "'and went abroad no more with Eol, "'and Eol mistrusted him. It came to pass that at the midsummer the dwarves, as was their custom, bade Eol to a feast in Nogrod, and he rode away. Now Maeglin and his mother were free for a while to go where they wished, and they rode often to the eaves of the wood, seeking the sunlight. And desire grew hot in Maeglin's heart to leave Nan Elmuth for ever. Therefore he said to Arathel, Lady, let us depart while there is time. What hope is there in this wood for you or for me? Here we are held in bondage, and no profit shall I find here, for I have learned all that my father has to teach, or that the Naugrim will reveal to me. Shall we not seek for Gondolin? You shall be my guide, and I will be your guard. Then Arathel was glad, and looked with pride upon her son, and telling the servants of Eol that they went to seek the sons of Feanor, they departed and rode away to the north eaves of Nan Elmoth. There they crossed the slender stream of Kelon into the land of Himlad, and rode on to the fords of Aros, and so westward along the fences of Doriath. Now Eol returned out of the east sooner than Maeglin had foreseen, and found his wife and his son but two days gone, and so great was his anger that he followed after them even by the light of day, as he entered the Himlad, he mastered his wrath and went warily, remembering his danger, for Kelagorm and Kurufin were mighty lords who loved Eol not at all, and Kurufin, moreover, was of perilous mood. But the scouts of Aglon had marked the riding of Maeglin and Arathel to the fords of Aros, and Kurufin, perceiving that strange deeds were afoot, came south from the pass and encamped near the fords. And before Eol had ridden far across the Himlad, he was waylaid by the riders of Kurufin and taken to their lord. 
Then Kurufin said to Eol, What errand have you, dark elf, in my lands? An urgent matter, perhaps, that keeps one so sun-shy abroad by day. And Eol, knowing his peril, restrained the bitter words that arose in his mind. I have learned, Lord Kurufin, he said, that my son and my wife, the White Lady of Gondolin, have ridden to visit you while I was from home, and it seemed to me fitting that I should join them on this errand. Then Kurufin laughed at Eol, and he said, <laughs> They might have found their welcome here less warm than they had hoped had you accompanied them. But it is no matter, for that was not their errand. It is not two days since they passed over the Arosiach, and thence rode swiftly westward. It seems that you would deceive me, unless indeed you yourself have been deceived. And Eol answered, Then, Lord, perhaps you will give me leave to go and discover the truth of this matter. You have my leave, but not my love, said Kurufin. The sooner you depart from my land, the better will it please me. Then Eol mounted his horse, saying, It is good, Lord Kurufin, to find a kinsman thus kindly at need. I will remember it when I return. Then Kurufin looked darkly upon Eol. Do not flaunt the title of your wife before me, he said, for those who steal the daughters of the Noldor and wed them without gift or leave do not gain kinship with their kin. I have given you leave to go, take it, and be gone. By the laws of the Eldar I may not slay you at this time, and this counsel I add. Return now to your dwelling in the darkness of Nan Elmoth, for my heart warns me that if you now pursue those who love you no more, never will you return thither. Then Eol rode off in haste, and he was filled with hatred of all the Noldor for he perceived now that Maeglin and Arathel were fleeing to Gondolin. And driven by anger and the shame of his humiliation, he crossed the fords of Aros and rode hard upon the way that they had gone before. And though they knew not that he followed them, and he had the swiftest steed, he came never in sight of them until they reached the Brithiach and abandoned their horses. Then, by ill fate, they were betrayed. For the horses neighed loudly, and Eol's steed heard them, and sped towards them. And Eol saw from afar the white raiment of Aravel, and marked which way she went, seeking the secret path into the mountains. Now Aravel and Maeglin came to the outer gate of Gondolin, and the dark guard under the mountains. And there she was received with joy, and passing through the seven gates, she came with Maeglin to Turgon, upon Amon Guareth. Then the king listened with wonder to all that Arathel had to tell, and he looked with liking upon Maeglin, his sister's son, seeing in him one worthy to be accounted among the princes of the Noldor. I rejoice indeed that Arfaniel has returned to Gondolin, he said, and now more fair again shall my city seem than in the days when I deemed her lost, and Maeglin shall have the highest honour in my realm. Then Maeglin bowed low, and took Torgon for lord and king to do all his will. But thereafter he stood silent and watchful, for the bliss and splendour of Gondolin surpassed all that he had imagined from the tales of his mother, and he was amazed by the strength of the city, and the hosts of its people, and the many things strange and beautiful that he beheld. Yet to none were his eyes more often drawn than to Idril, the king's daughter. Who sat beside him, for she was golden as the Vanya, her mother's kindred, and she seemed to him as the sun from which all the king's hall drew its light. But Eol, following after Arathel, found the dry river and the secret path, and so creeping in by stealth, he came to the guard, and was taken and questioned. And when the guard heard that he claimed Arathel as wife, they were amazed and sent a swift messenger to the city, and he came to the king's hall. Lord, he cried, the guard have taken captive one that came by stealth to the dark gate, Eol, he names himself, and he is a tall elf, dark and grim, of the kindred of the Sindar. 
yet he claims the Lady Arathel as his wife, and demands to be brought before you. His wrath is great, and he is hard to restrain, but we have not slain him as your law commands. Then Arathel said, Alas, Aeol has followed us even as I feared, but with great stealth was it done, for we saw and heard no pursuit as we entered upon the hidden way. And then she said to the messenger, He speaks but the truth. He is Aeol, and I am his wife, and he is the father of my son. Slay him not, but lead him hither to the king's judgment, if the king so wills. And so it was done. And Aeol was brought into Turgon's hall, and stood before his high seat, proud and sullen. Though he was amazed no less than his son at all that he saw, his heart was filled the more with anger and with hate of the Noldor. But Torgon treated him with honour, and rose up and would take his hands. And he said, Welcome, kinsman, for so I hold you. Here you shall dwell at your pleasure, save only that you must here abide and depart not from my kingdom, for it is my law that none who finds the way hither shall depart. But Aeol withdrew his hand. I acknowledge not your law, he said. No right have you or any of your kin in this land to seize realms or to set bounds either here or there. This is the land of the Teleri, to which you bring war and all unquiet, dealing ever proudly and unjustly. I care nothing for your secrets, and I came not to spy upon you, but to claim my own, my wife and my son. Yet if in Arathel, your sister, you have some claim, then let her remain, let the bird go back to the cage, where soon she will sicken again as she sickened before. But not so, Maeglin. My son you shall not withhold from me. Come, Maeglin, son of Aeol. Your father commands you. Leave the house of his enemies and the slayers of his kin, or be accursed. But Maeglin answered nothing. Then Torgon sat in his high seat, holding his staff of doom, and in a stern voice spoke. I will not debate with you, dark elf. By the swords of the Noldor alone are your sunless woods defended. Your freedom to wander there wild you owe to my kin. And, but for them, long since, you would have laboured in thraldom in the pits of Angband. And here I am king. And whether you will it or will it not, my doom is law. This choice only is given to you, to abide here or to die here, and so also for your son. Then Aeol looked into the eyes of King Turgon, and he was not daunted, but stood long without word or movement, while a still silence fell upon the hall. And Arathel was afraid, knowing that he was perilous. Suddenly, swift as a serpent, he seized a javelin that he held beneath his cloak, and cast it at Maeglin, crying, the second choice I take, and for my son also, you shall not hold what is mine. But Arathel sprang before the dart, and it smote her in the shoulder, and Aeol was overborne by many, and set in bonds and led away, while others tended Arathel. But Maeglin, looking upon his father, was silent. It was appointed that Aeol should be brought on the next day to the king's judgment. And Arathel and Idril moved Turgon to mercy. But in the evening Arathel sickened, though the wound had seemed little, and she fell into the darkness, and in the night she died. For the point of the javelin was poisoned, though none knew it until too late. Therefore, when Aeol was brought before Turgon, he found no mercy, and they led him forth to the Karagdur, a precipice of black rock upon the north side of the hill of Gondolin, there to cast him down from the sheer walls of the city. And Maeglin stood by and said nothing. But at the last Aeol cried out, So you forsake your father and his kin, ill-gotten son. Here shall you fail of all your hopes, and here may you yet die the same death as I. 
Then they cast Aeol over the Karak Dur, and so he ended, and to all in Gondolin it seemed just. But Idril was troubled, and from that day she mistrusted her kinsmen. But Meglin prospered and grew great among the Gondolindrim, praised by all and high in the favour of Turgon. For if he would learn eagerly and swiftly all that he might, he had much also to teach. And he gathered about him all such as had the most bent to smithcraft and mining. And he sought in the Echoriath, which are the encircling mountains, and found rich loads of ore of divers metals. Most he prized the hard iron of the mine of Anghabar in the north of the Echoriath. And thence he got a wealth of forged metal and steel, so that the arms of the Gondolindrim were made ever stronger and more keen. And that stood them in good stead in the days to come. Wise in counsel was Meglin and wary, and yet hardy and valiant at need. And that was seen in after days. For when in the dread year of the Nienaith Arnoidiad, Turgon opened his leaguer and marched forth to the help of Fingon in the north, Meglin would not remain in Gondolin as regent of the king, but went to the war and fought beside Turgon, and proved fell and fearless in battle. Thus all seemed well with the fortunes of Meglin, who had risen to be mighty among the princes of the Noldor, and greatest save one in the most renowned of their realms. Yet he did not reveal his heart. And though not all things went as he would, he endured it in silence, hiding his mind so that few could read it, unless it were Idril Celebrindo. For from his first days in Gondolin he had borne a grief ever worsening that robbed him of all joy. He loved the beauty of Idril, and desired her without hope. The Eldar wedded not with kin so near, nor ever before had any desire to do so. And however that might be, Idriel loved Meglin not at all. And knowing his thought of her, she loved him the less, for it seemed to her a thing strange and crooked in him, as indeed the Eldar ever since have deemed it, an evil fruit of the kinslaying, whereby the shadow of the curse of Mandos fell upon the last hope of the Noldor. But as the years passed, still Meglin watched Idril and waited, and his love turned to darkness in his heart, and he sought the more to have his will in other matters, shirking no toil or burden, if he might thereby have power. Thus it was in Gondolin, and amid all the bliss of that realm, while its glory lasted, a dark seed of evil was sown. Of the coming of men into the West. When three hundred years and more were gone since the Noldor came to Beleriand, in the days of the long peace, Finrod Felagund, lord of Nargothrond, journeyed east of Sirion and went hunting with Maglor and Maedhros, sons of Feanor. But he wearied of the chase and passed on alone towards the mountains of Eredlindon that he saw shining afar. And taking the dwarf road, he crossed Gelion at the ford of San Athrad, and turning south over the upper streams of Asgard, he came into the north of Assyrian. In a valley among the foothills of the mountains below the springs of Thalos, he saw lights in the evening, and far off he heard the sound of song. At this he wondered much, for the green elves of that land lit no fires, nor did they sing by night. At first, he feared that a raid of orcs had passed the leaguer of the north, but as he drew near, he perceived that it was not so, for the singers used a tongue that he had not heard before, neither that of dwarves nor of orcs. Then Felagund, standing silent in the night shadow of the trees, looked down into the camp, and there he beheld a strange people. Now these were a part of the kindred and following of Beor the old, as he was afterwards called, a chieftain among men. After many lives of wandering out of the east, he had led them at last over the Blue Mountains, the first of the race of men, to enter Beleriand. And they sang because they were glad, 
and believed that they had escaped from all perils and had come at last to a land without fear. Long Felagund watched them, and love for them stirred in his heart. But he remained hidden in the trees until they had all fallen asleep. Then he went among the sleeping people and sat beside their dying fire where none kept watch. And he took up a rude harp which Beor had laid aside, and he played music upon it such as the ears of men had not heard. For they had as yet no teachers in the art, save only the dark elves in the wild lands. Now men awoke and listened to Felagund as he harped and sang, and each thought that he was in some fair dream, until he saw that his fellows were awake also beside him. But they did not speak or stir while Felagund still played, because of the beauty of the music and the wonder of the song. Wisdom was in the words of the elven king, and the hearts grew wiser that hearkened to him. For the things of which he sang, of the making of Arda, and the bliss of Ammon beyond the shadows of the sea, came as clear visions before their eyes, and his elvish speech was interpreted in each mind according to its measure. Thus it was that men called King Felagund, whom they first met of all the Eldar, Gnome, that is, wisdom in the language of that people, and after him they named his folk Gnomin, the wise. Indeed, they believed at first that Felagund was one of the Valar, of whom they had heard rumour that they dwelt far in the west, and this was, some say, the cause of their journeying. But Felagund dwelt among them, and taught them true knowledge, and they loved him, and took him for their lord, and were ever after loyal to the house of Finarfin. Now the Eldar were beyond all other peoples skilled in tongues and Felagun discovered also that he could read in the minds of men such thoughts as they wished to reveal in speech, so that their words were easily interpreted. It is said also that these men had long had dealings with the dark elves east of the mountains, and from them had learned much of their speech. And since all the languages of the Quendi were of one origin, the language of Beor and his folk resembled the elven tongue in many words and devices. It was not long, therefore, before Felagund could hold converse with Beor. And while he dwelt with him, they spoke much together. But when he questioned him concerning the arising of men and their journeys, Beor would say little, and indeed he knew little, for the fathers of his people had told few tales of their past, and the silence had fallen upon their memory. A darkness lies behind us, Beor said. And we have turned our backs upon it, and we do not desire to return thither even in thought. Westwards our hearts have been turned, and we believe that there we shall find light. But it was said afterwards among the Eldar, that when men awoke in Hildorian at the rising of the sun, the spies of Morgoth were watchful, and tidings were soon brought to him. And this seemed to him so great a matter that secretly under shadow he himself departed from Angband, and went forth into Middle-earth, leaving to Sauron the command of the war. Of his dealings with men, the Eldar indeed knew nothing at that time, and learned but little afterwards, but that a darkness lay upon the hearts of men, as the shadow of the kinslaying and the doom of Mandos lay upon the Noldor, they perceived clearly even in the people of the elf-friends whom they first knew. To corrupt or destroy whatsoever arose new and fair was ever the chief desire of Morgoth. And doubtless he had this purpose also in his errand, by fear and lies to make men the foes of the Eldar, and bring them up out of the east against Beleriand. But this design was slow to ripen, and was never wholly achieved. For men, it is said, were at first very few in number, whereas Morgoth grew afraid of the growing power and union of the Eldar, and came back to Angband, leaving behind at that time but few servants, and those of less might and cunning. Now Felagund learned from Beor that there were many other men of like mind who were also journeying westward. Others of my own kin have crossed the mountains, he said, and they are wandering not far away. 
and the Haladin, a people from whom we are sundered in speech, are still in the valleys on the eastern slopes, awaiting tidings before they venture further. There are yet other men whose tongue is more like to ours, with whom we have had dealings at times. They were before us on the westward march, but we passed them, for they are a numerous people, and yet keep together and move slowly, being all ruled by one chieftain whom they call Marach. Now the green elves of Assyrian were troubled by the coming of men, and when they heard that a lord of the Eldar from over the sea was among them, they sent messengers to Felagund. Lord, they said, if you have power over these newcomers, bid them return by the ways that they came, or else to go forward. For we desire no strangers in this land to break the peace in which we live, and these folk are hewers of trees and hunters of beasts, Therefore we are their unfriends, and if they will not depart, we shall afflict them in all ways that we can. Then, by the advice of Felagund, Beor gathered all the wandering families and kindreds of his people, and they removed over Gelion, and took up their abode in the lands of Amrod and Amras, upon the east banks of the Kelon, south of Nan Elmoth, near to the borders of Doriath. And the name of that land thereafter was Estolag, the encampment. But when after a year had passed, Felagund wished to return to his own country, Beor begged leave to come with him, and he remained in the service of the king of Nargothrond while his life lasted. In this way he got his name Beor, whereas his name before had been Balan, for Beor signified vassal in the tongue of his people. The rule of his folk he committed to Baran, his eldest son, and he did not return again to Estolad. Soon after the departure of Felagund, the other men of whom Beor had spoken came also into Beleriand. First came the Haladin, but meeting the unfriendship of the green elves, they turned north and dwelt in Thargelion, in the country of Caranthia, son of Feanor. There for a time they had peace, and the people of Caranthia paid little heed to them. In the next year, Marach led his people over the mountains. They were a tall and warlike folk, marching in ordered companies, and the elves of Assyrian hid themselves and did not waylay them. But Marach, hearing that the people of Beor were dwelling in a green and fertile land, came down the dwarf road and settled in the country south and east of the dwellings of Baran, son of Beor, and there was great friendship between those peoples. Felagund himself often returned to visit men, and many other elves out of the west lands, both Noldor and Sindar, journeyed to Estolad, being eager to see the Edain, whose coming had long been foretold. Now Atani, the second people, was the name given to men in Valinor in the law that told of their coming. But in the speech of Beleriand, that name became Edain. And it was there used only of the three kindreds of the elf friends. Fingolfin, as king of all the Noldor, sent messengers of welcome to them. And then many young and eager men of the Edain went away and took service with the kings and lords of the Eldar. Among them was Malach, son of Marach, and he dwelt in Hithlam for fourteen years, and he learned the elven tongue and was given the name of Aradan. The Edain did not long dwell content in Estolad, for many still desired to go westward, but they did not know the way. Before them lay the fences of Doriath, and southward lay Sirion and its impassable fens. Therefore the kings of the three houses of the Noldor, seeing hope of strength in the sons of men, sent word that any of the Edain that wished might remove and come to dwell among their people. In this way the migration of the Edain began. At first, little by little, but later in families and kindreds, they arose and left Estolad until after some fifty years many thousands had entered the lands of the kings. Most of these took the long road northwards, until the ways became well known to them. The people of Beor 
came to Dorthonion and dwelt in lands ruled by the house of Finarfin. The people of Aradan, for Marach his father remained in Estolad until his death, for the most part went on westward, and some came to Hithlam. But Magor, son of Aradan, and many of the people passed down Syrian into Beleriand, and dwelt a while in the vales of the southern slopes of Ered Wethrin. It is said that in all these matters none save Finrod Felagund took counsel with King Thingol, and he was ill-pleased, both for that reason and because he was troubled by dreams concerning the coming of men, ere ever the first tidings of them were heard. Therefore he commanded that men should take no lands to dwell in save in the north, and that the princes whom they served should be answerable for all that they did. And he said, Into Doriath shall no man come while my realm lasts, not even those of the house of Beor, who serve Finrod the Beloved. Melian said nothing to him at that time, but afterwards she said to Galadriel, Now the world runs on swiftly to great tidings, and one of men, even of Beor's house, shall indeed come, and the girdle of Melian shall not restrain him, for doom greater than my power shall send him, and the songs that shall spring from that coming shall endure when all Middle-earth is changed. But many men remained in Estolad, and there was still a mingled people living there long years after, until in the ruin of Beleriand they were overwhelmed or fled back into the east. For beside the old who deemed that their wandering days were over, there were not a few who desired to go their own ways, and they feared the elder and the light of their eyes. And then dissensions awoke among the Edain, in which the shadow of Morgoth may be discerned, for certain it is that he knew of the coming of men into Beleriand, and of their growing friendship with the elves. The leaders of discontent were Bereg, of the house of Beor, and Amlach, one of the grandsons of Marach, and they said openly, We took long roads desiring to escape the perils of Middle-earth and the dark things that dwell there, for we heard that there was light in the west. But now we learn that the light is beyond the sea. Thither we cannot come where the gods dwell in bliss, save one, for the Lord of the Dark is here before us, and the Eldar wise but fell, who make endless war upon him. In the north he dwells, they say, and there is the pain and death from which we fled. We will not go that way. Then a council and assembly of men was called, and great numbers came together. And the elf friends answered Bereg, saying, Truly from the dark king come all the evils from which we fled, but he seeks dominion over all Middle-earth, and whither now shall we turn, and he will not pursue us? Unless he be vanquished here, or at least held in leaguer. Only by the valour of the Eldar is he restrained, and maybe it was for this purpose, to aid them at need, that we were brought into this land. To this Bereg answered, Let the Eldar look to it. Our lives are short enough. But there arose one who seemed to all to be Amlach, son of Imlach, speaking fell words that shook the hearts of all who heard him. All this is but elvish lore, tales to beguile newcomers that are unwary. The sea has no shore. There is no light in the west. You have followed a full fire of the elves to the end of the world. Which of you has seen the least of the gods? Who has beheld the dark king in the north? Those who seek the dominion of Middle-earth are the Eldar. Greedy for wealth, they have delved in the earth for its secrets, and have stirred to wrath the things that dwell beneath it, as they have ever done and ever shall. Let the orcs have the realm that is theirs, and we will have ours. There is room in the world, if the Eldar will let us be. Then those that listened sat for a while astounded, and a shadow of fear fell on their hearts, and they resolved to depart far from the lands of the Eldar. But afterwards Amlach returned among them, and denied that he had been present at their debate, or had spoken such words as they reported. 
and there was doubt and bewilderment among men. Then the elf friends said, You will now believe this, at least. There is indeed a dark lord, and his spies and emissaries are among us, for he fears us and the strength that we may give to his foes. But some still answered, He hates us, rather, and ever the more the longer we dwell here meddling in his quarrel with the kings of the Eldar to no gain of ours. Many, therefore, of those that yet remained in Estolad made ready to depart, and Bereg led a thousand of the people of Beor away southwards, and they passed out of the songs of those days. But Amlach repented, saying, I have now a quarrel of my own with this master of lies, which will last to my life's end. And he went away north and entered the service of Maedhros. But those of his people who were of like mind with Bereg chose a new leader, and they went back over the mountains into Eriador, and are forgotten. During this time the Haladin remained in Thargelion, and were content. But Morgoth, seeing that by lies and deceits he could not yet wholly estrange elves and men, was filled with wrath, and endeavoured to do men what hurt he could. Therefore he sent out an orc raid, and passing east it escaped the leaguer, and came in stealth back over Ered Lindon, by the passes of the dwarf road, and fell upon the Haladin in the southern woods of the land of Caranthia. Now the Haladin did not live under the rule of lords, or many together, but each homestead was set apart, and governed its own affairs, and they were slow to unite. But there was among them a man named Haldad, who was masterful and fearless, and he gathered all the brave men that he could find, and retreated to the angle of land between Asgard and Gelion, and in the utmost corner he built a stockade across from water to water and behind it they led all the women and children that they could save. There they were besieged until their food was gone. Haldad had twin children, Halef, his daughter, and Haldar, his son, and both were valiant in the defence, for Halef was a woman of great heart and strength. But at last Haldad was slain in a sortie against the orcs, and Haldar, who rushed out to save his father's body from their butchery, was hewn down beside him. Then Haleth held the people together, though they were without hope, and some cast themselves in the rivers and were drowned. But seven days later, as the orcs made their last assault and had already broken through the stockade, there came suddenly a music of trumpets, and Caranthea with his host came down from the north and drove the orcs into the rivers. Then Caranthea looked kindly upon men, and did Haleth great honour, and he offered her recompense for her father and brother. And seeing, over late, what valour there was in the Idain, he said to her, If you will remove and dwell further north, there you shall have the friendship and protection of the elder, and free lands of your own. But Haleth was proud and unwilling to be guided or ruled, and most of the Haladin were of like mood. Therefore she thanked Caranthea, but answered, My mind is now set, Lord, to leave the shadow of the mountains and go west, whither others of our kin have gone. When therefore the Haladin had gathered all whom they could find alive of their folk, who had fled wild into the woods before the orcs, and had gleaned what remained of their goods in their burned homesteads, they took Haleth for their chief, and she led them at last to Estolad, and there dwelt for a time. But there remained a people apart, and were ever after known to elves and men as the people of Haleth. Haleth remained their chief while her days lasted, but she did not wed, and the headship afterwards passed to Haldan, son of Haldar, her brother. Soon, however, Haleth desired to move westward again, and, though most of her people were against this council, she led them forth once more, and they went without help or guidance of the Eldar, and passing over Kelon and Aros, they journeyed in the perilous land between the mountains of Terror and the girdle of Melian. That land was even then not yet so evil as it after became, but it was no road for mortal men to take without aid, 
and Haleth only brought her people through it with hardship and loss, constraining them to go forward by the strength of her will. At last they crossed over the Brithiach, and many bitterly repented of their journey. But there was now no returning. Therefore, in new lands they went back to their old life as best they could, and they dwelt in free homesteads in the woods of Talath Dirnan, beyond Teglin, and some wandered far into the realm of Nargothrond. But there were many who loved the Lady Haleth, and wished to go whither she would, and dwell under her rule, and these she led into the forest of Brethil, between Teglin and Sirion. Thither, in the evil days that followed, many of her scattered folk returned. Now Brethil was claimed as part of his realm by King Thingol, though it was not within the girdle of Melian, and he would have denied it to Haleth. But Felagund, who had the friendship of Thingol, hearing of all that had befallen the people of Haleth, obtained this grace for her, that she should dwell free in Brethil, upon the condition only that her people should guard the crossings of Teglin against all enemies of the Eldar, and allow no orcs to enter their woods. To this Haleth answered, Where are Haldad my father, and Haldar my brother? If the king of Doriath fears a friendship between Haleth and those who have devoured her kin, then the thoughts of the Eldar are strange to men. And Haleth dwelt in Brethil until she died, and her people raised a green mound over her in the heights of the forest. Tur Haretha, the Lady Barrow, how then Arwen in the Sindarin tongue. In this way it came to pass that the Edain dwelt in the lands of the Eldar, some here, some there, some wandering, some settled in kindreds or small peoples. And the most part of them soon learned the grey elven tongue, both as a common speech among themselves, and because many were eager to learn the law of the elves. But after a time, the elf kings, seeing that it was not good for elves and men to dwell mingled together without order, and that men needed lords of their own kind, set regions apart where men could live their own lives, and appointed chieftains to hold these lands freely. They were the allies of the Eldar in war, but marched under their own leaders. Yet many of the Edain had delight in the friendship of the elves, and dwelt among them for so long as they had leave, and the young men often took service, for a time, in the hosts of the kings. Now Hador Lorindal, son of Hathol, son of Magor, son of Malach Aradan, entered the household of Fingolfin in his youth, and was loved by the king. Fingolfin therefore gave to him the lordship of Dor Lomin, and into that land he gathered most of the people of his kin, and became the mightiest of the chieftains of the Edain. In his house only the elven tongue was spoken. But their own speech was not forgotten, and from it came the common tongue of Numenor. But in Dothonian the lordship of the people of Beor and the country of Ladros was given to Boromir, son of Boron, who was the grandson of Beor the Old. The sons of Hador were Galdor and Gundor, and the sons of Galdor were Hurin and Huor, and the son of Hurin was Turin, the bane of Glaurung, and the son of Huor was Tuor, father of Earendil, the Blessed. The son of Boromir was Bregor, whose sons were Bregolas and Barahir, and the sons of Bregolas were Baragund and Beligund. The daughter of Baragund was Morwen, the mother of Turin, and the daughter of Belagund was Rian, the mother of Tuor. But the son of Barahir was Beren one hand, who won the love of Luthien Thingol's daughter, and returned from the dead. From them came Elwing, the wife of Earendil, and all the kings of Númenor after. All these were caught in the net of the doom of the Noldor, and they did great deeds which the Eldar remember still among the histories of the kings of old. And in those days the strength of men was added to the power of the Noldor, and their hope was high, and Morgoth was straitly enclosed, 
for the people of Hador, being hardy to endure cold and long wandering, feared not at times to go far into the north and there keep watch upon the movements of the enemy. The men of the three houses throve and multiplied, but greatest among them was the house of Hador Goldenhead, peer of elven lords. His people were of great strength and stature, ready in mind, bold and steadfast, quick to anger and to laughter, mighty among the children of Iluvata in the youth of mankind. Yellow-haired they were, for the most part, and blue-eyed. But not so was Turin, whose mother was Morwen of the house of Beor. The men of that house were dark or brown of hair, with grey eyes, and of all men they were most like to the Noldor, and most loved by them. For they were eager of mind, cunning-handed, swift in understanding, long in memory, and they were moved sooner to pity than to laughter. Like to them were the woodland folk of Haleth, but they were of lesser stature and less eager for lore. They used few words, and did not love great concourse of men, and many among them delighted in solitude, wandering free in the green woods, while the wonder of the lands of the Eldar was new upon them. But in the realms of the West their time was brief, and their days unhappy. The years of the Idain were lengthened according to the reckoning of men after their coming to Beleriand. But at last Beor the Old died when he had lived three and ninety years, for four and forty of which he had served King Felagund. And when he lay dead, of no wound or grief but stricken by age, the Eldar saw for the first time the swift waning of the life of men, and the death of weariness, which they knew not in themselves. And they grieved greatly for the loss of their friends. But Beor at the last had relinquished his life willingly and passed in peace, and the Eldar wondered much at the strange fate of men, for in all their lore there was no account of it, and its end was hidden from them. Nonetheless, the Edain of old learned swiftly of the Eldar all such art and knowledge as they could receive, and their sons increased in wisdom and skill until they far surpassed all others of mankind, who dwelt still east of the mountains and had not seen the Eldar nor looked upon the faces that had beheld the light of Valinor. Of the Ruin of Beleriand and the Fall of Fingolfin Now Fingolfin, king of the north and high king of the Noldor, seeing that his people were become numerous and strong, and that the men allied to them were many and valiant, pondered once more an assault upon Angband for he knew that they lived in danger while the circle of the siege was incomplete, and Morgoth was free to labour in his deep mines, devising what evils none could foretell ere he should reveal them. This counsel was wise according to the measure of his knowledge, for the Noldor did not yet comprehend the fullness of the power of Morgoth, nor understand that their unaided war upon him was without final hope, whether they hasted or delayed. But because the land was fair and their kingdoms wide, most of the Noldor were content with things as they were, trusting them to last, and slow to begin an assault in which many must surely perish, were it in victory or in defeat. Therefore they were little disposed to hearken to Fingolfin and the sons of Feanor at that time least of all. Among the chieftains of the Noldor, Angrod and Egnor alone were of like mind with the king, for they dwelt in regions whence Thangorodrim could be descried, and the threat of Morgoth was present to their thought. Thus the designs of Fingolfin came to naught, and the land had peace yet for a while. But when the sixth generation of men after Beor and Marach were not yet come to full manhood, it being then four hundred years and five and fifty since the coming of Fingolfin, the evil befell that he had long dreaded, and yet more dire and sudden than his darkest fear. For Morgoth had long prepared his force in secret, while ever the malice of his heart grew greater, and his hatred of the Noldor more bitter. 
and he desired not only to end his foes, but to destroy also and defile the lands that they had taken and made fair. And it is said that his hate overcame his counsel, so that if he had but endured to wait longer until his designs were full, then the Noldor would have perished utterly. But on his part he esteemed too lightly the valour of the elves, and of men he took yet no account. There came a time of winter when night was dark and without moon, and the wide plain of Ard Garland stretched dim beneath the cold stars, from the hill forts of the Noldor to the feet of Thangorodrim. The watchfires burned low, and the guards were few. On the plain few were waking in the camps of the horsemen of Hithlum. Then suddenly Morgoth sent forth great rivers of flame that ran down swifter than Balrogs from Thangorodrim, and poured over all the plain. And the mountains of iron belched forth fires of many poisonous hues, and the fume of them stank upon the air, and was deadly. Thus Ardgarlan perished, and fire devoured its grasses, and it became a burned and desolate waste full of a choking dust, barren and lifeless. Thereafter its name was changed, and it was called and Fauglith, the gasping dust. Many charred bones had there their roofless grave, for many of the Noldor perished in that burning, who were caught by the running flame and could not fly to the hills. The heights of Dorthonion and Eredwethrin held back the fiery torrents, but their woods upon the slopes that looked towards Angband were all kindled, and the smoke wrought confusion among the defenders. Thus began the fourth of the great battles, Dagor Bragolach, the Battle of Sudden Flame. In the front of that fire came Glaurung the Golden, father of dragons, in his full might, and in his train were Balrogs, and behind them came the black armies of the Orcs, in multitudes such as the Noldor had never before seen or imagined. And they assaulted the fortresses of the Noldor, and broke the leaguer about Angband, and slew wherever they found them, the Noldor and their allies, grey elves and men. Many of the stoutest of the foes of Morgoth were destroyed in the first days of that war, bewildered and dispersed, and unable to muster their strength. War ceased not wholly ever again in Beleriand. But the Battle of Sudden Flame is held to have ended with the coming of spring, when the onslaught of Morgoth grew less. Thus ended the siege of Angban, and the foes of Morgoth were scattered and sundered one from another. The most part of the grey elves fled south and forsook the northern war. Many were received into Doriath, and the kingdom and strength of Thingol grew greater in that time, for the power of Melian the queen was woven about his borders, and evil could not yet enter that hidden realm. Others took refuge in the fortresses by the sea, and in Nargothrond, and some fled the land and hid themselves in Ossiriand, or passing the mountains wandered homeless in the wild. And rumours of the war and the breaking of the siege reached the ears of men in the east of Middle-earth. The sons of Finarfin bore most heavily the brunt of the assault, and Angrod and Egnor were slain. Beside them fell Bregolas, lord of the house of Beor, and a great part of the warriors of that people. But Barahir, the brother of Bregolas, was in the fighting further westward, near to the pass of Sirion. There King Finrod Felagund, hastening from the south, was cut off from his people, and surrounded with small company in the fen of Serech. And he would have been slain or taken, but Barahir came up with the bravest of his men, and rescued him, and made a wall of spears about him, and they cut their way out of the battle with great loss. Thus Felagund escaped, and returned to his deep fortress of Nargothrond. But he swore an oath of abiding friendship, and aid in every need to Barahir and all his kin, and in token of his vow he gave to Barahir his ring. Barahir was now by right lord of the house of Beor and he returned to Dorthonion. 
but most of his people fled from their homes and took refuge in the fastness of Hithlam. So great was the onslaught of Morgoth that Fingolfin and Fingon could not come to the aid of the sons of Finarfin, and the hosts of Hithlam were driven back with great loss to the fortresses of Eredwethrin, and these they hardly defended against the orcs. Before the walls of Aethel Sirion fell Hador the Golden-Haired, defending the rearguard of his lord Fingolfin, being then sixty and six years of age. And with him fell Gundor, his younger son, pierced with many arrows, and they were mourned by the elves. Then Galdor the Tall took the lordship of his father, and because of the strength and height of the shadowy mountains which withstood the torrent of fire, and by the valour of the elves and the men of the north, which neither Orc nor Balrog could yet overcome, Hithlum remained unconquered, a threat upon the flank of Morgoth's attack. But Fingolfin was sundered from his kinsmen by a sea of foes. For the war had gone ill with the sons of Feanor, and well-nigh all the